A quick five-year return on investment. That was the political pitch to Canadians when Volkswagen got a massive subsidy to build an electric vehicle battery plant in Ontario, which was followed up with another big investment for a similar Stellantis plant deal. The two totaling commitments for more than $28 billion in subsidies by the end of 2032. Now, a new report from Parliament's budget watchdog finds Canadians will be, will be waiting, pardon me, a lot longer just to break even on those deals. Parliamentary Budget Officer Yves Giroux is here now to explain. Mr. Giroux, pleasure to welcome you back to the studio. I appreciate you making the time. My pleasure. So the government and, and Mr. Champagne, who you just heard there, basically says in your analysis, you only accounted for 8% of the possible kind of spin-off economic impacts of these plants, and therefore they, that's how they account for the discrepancy in the timeline. They say five years, you say 20 years. How do you account for the discrepancy? Well, uh, the discrepancy is explained by the fact that the government used a report that looks at all the potential um, spin-offs from the investments or the subsidies for Stellantis and Volkswagen. And in that report, which was produced by the Trillium Network, uh, it's estimated that because of this investment or subsidies, there will be a plethora of supply chain elements that will be uh, Canadian made. For example, mineral exploration, metals exploitation, EV assembly plants, electric vehicle assembly plants, that will be on top of the existing auto sector in the country, despite the fact that we're being told uh, combustion engine cars will be phased out, will be replaced by EVs, but that report assumes that everything will be sourced in Canada, assembly will take place in Canada, even though Volkswagen doesn't have an assembly plant in Canada. They are building a battery plant, but not a, an auto assembly plant in Canada. So this, the report on which the minister is basing his uh, statement that it will pay off the, the subsidies will pay themselves off in less than five years, assumes that all this activity will take place, which is, I don't think is likely, given that we have a very integrated auto sector in, the, in Canada, in North America, so it could well take place in the U.S. or in Mexico or even elsewhere. So it's based on a series of very, very optimistic assumptions. So the assumptions then that you took into account in your own calculation, I imagine, are, are what I read, was basically the stuff that already exists. Is that accurate? Like the stuff we know is here? Yeah, the stuff that will be created by these subsidies. So we know there will be two plants, two battery plants that will be built and that will generate economic activity. So we know that. So we factor in the ripple effects of these two these two, these two battery plants, but we don't uh, factor in all the other things that could happen exclusively in Canada because North America is an integrated automobile sector where activity takes place in the U.S., in Canada, in Mexico, and there's no reason why Volkswagen would source only from Canada if they can get a better deal elsewhere. And in fact, in the report on which the minister is basing his statements, it says that for all these other things to happen, these wonderful things to happen, billions of dollars in additional subsidies will be required if we want to have an end-to-end -end Canadian sector that supplies the batteries and the materials and also the uh, assembly for the EVs. So the report itself states that the government will need to f provide billions more in subsidies for these uh, impacts to be felt. Do you concede there is a world in which if they do provide those incentives, there could be an end-to-end -end, uh, process here in Canada and the the, the timeline the government has provided, if in fact that were to come to fruition, could be accurate? I don't think that's possible because that Not would require extra extraordinary investments pri by private corporations in the span of just a few years mm -hmm. to ramp up capacity. Like, for example, building an EV assembly plant, uh, assembling the vehicles themselves, that can't happen overnight. It takes several, several years. And to my knowledge, Volkswagen doesn't have an assembly plant in Canada, and I haven't heard that there is any plan to, to make that happen. Could you, for people listening tonight and watching tonight, characterize from where you sit in the sort of historical context, unique historical context you have looking at the federal government's books for so many years, the scale and scope of these investments, like $28 billion for two plants, like how big is that from where you sit? It's huge. It's enough to make 
all the inhabitants of a medium or small town in Canada millionaires. It's massive. So you're talking about something of, in the order of magnitude of $5 million for each and every one of the workers at the Volkswagen plant. Granted, it's a, over a number of years, mm -hmm. but it's on a level that's rarely been seen in Canada, the level of subsidies. But you do see that money being recouped over a 20-year period, maybe worst-case scenario? Is that the way to say no, it, or I think most that, accurate scenario from I where think, you sit? I, I think that's still quite optimistic because really? that would assume that both plants continue to run at full capacity uh, almost, well, more than 10 years after the federal subsidies have, have been uh, eliminated or have stopped being paid. And that's quite strong in terms of assumptions, that in, in and of itself. Speaking of assumptions, because I have you here, I just wanted to ask you uh, very quickly a broader question about the federal government's books. We're six months out from the last budget. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I think from a you know individual perspective, we're looking at the cost of living right now, interest rates, and the degree to which the economy is slowing, particularly with the latest GDP data mm -hmm. out about the second quarter. Lots of economists are saying, you know, it might ground to a halt for a little while. The potential for a recession exists. Uh, what do you, at the, do you have a sense at this point of what the impact on federal revenues might be of that? Of the economy slowing, slowing down? Slowing down, like how, how, even if you don't have, a, I know you like they don't have a number, but do you, do you have a sense of whether it could be a large impact? Well, it could be a significant impact if it's a marked slowdown, but so far we have seen some contraction in the latest quarter for which data was available, but the labor market is still quite resilient, so it, it suggests that the f impact on the federal finances is not expected to be dramatic. In fact, when the minister tabled her budget in April, she had uh, factored in a, a significant slowdown of the Canadian economy. So what we have seen so far should not negatively affect the federal finances to a large extent, at least. There's also a big, and I know you're familiar with it, political conversation about fiscal responsibility. What is it? What does it entail? What, does different, what do different political parties mean when they say it? The new president of the Treasury Board, Anina Anand, recently talked about, and this was in the budget as well, but $15 billion of savings, planned plan spending cut over five years. Mm -hmm. Can you characterize from your perspective how big of a chunk is that? Like, is that meaningful? Uh, it's meaningful, of course, when you're talking about $15 billion, but it averages about three, three and a half billion per year, depending on the year at which you look. Uh, so it's not a significant, like, deep cuts. Uh, you put the brakes slightly on some categories of spending, and right there you have your $15 billion. So it's quite easily achievable, especially considering that the government has expanded significantly over the last several years. So it's not something that should be um, very difficult to achieve. And just really quickly, bond yields and interest rates. I'm very curious as to your thoughts on or how closely you're watching their potential impact in the long run on the, the cost of servicing the debt, basically, the, the, for the government's cost of servicing the debt. Could that potentially be impacted? Oh, yeah, that's, that's something that is a, a big driver in overall government expenditures, especially the debt servicing costs. <laughs> So do you anticipate these higher rates and, and the, uh, the bond, international bond yields right now will have a more long-term impact on how much they end up paying to service this debt? Well, the longer the interest rates stay high or at their current level, uh, the more impact it will have on debt servicing costs, which have already doubled compared to a few years ago. And if interest rates stay at that level or even go higher, it will continue to have a negative impact on debt servicing costs, meaning they'll keep on rising. Okay, Mr. Sheru, I'm going to leave it there. Appreciate your time and your insights as always. Thank you. Always a pleasure.